So today we're going to start off with the current affairs for today as well as some of the topics from yesterday like what we usually do. Now, some of the most important topics that were there in the newspaper today and yesterday are the Sri Lankan Navy arrests Indian fishermen. This has been there in the news for a while now since the Sri Lankan foreign minister was in India some time back. Hence, this issue has been done already. But this is a constant issue until we find a proper solution for it. And hence, it will keep coming up. Uh, and the most important thing that a democracy is known for, which is constant elections. And hence, since we have the elections which are going on in Goa and Uttarakhand today, we shall see what are the steps that constitute elections. Hmm. Also, we saw that the Indian External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar has been in Australia. And uh, since he has been in Australia, we have been discussing the interim agreement before we, we go for a full-fledged free trade agreement with Australia. The free trade agreement with Australia has been in the docks for a while now. And uh, there has been some uh, progress on it. Also, there is a little bit of news about modified element uh, elephant, which is a group which has been trying to implant information on individuals and make them convicts. Apart from that, uh, we are seeing ISRO's first uh, satellite launch. And also we shall conclude with St. Ramanuja Sharya. Now, moving on. The first news is Sri Lankan Navy arrests Indian fishermen. In the third such incident in the Park Bay area in the past two months, the Sri Lankan Navy on Saturday arrested 12 fishermen from Rameshwaram in Tamil Nadu and seized two boats on the charge of poaching. Like what we said, this is a very frequently occurring uh, phenomenon. In the third such incident in the last two months, this shows the number of uh, events uh, which have been happening like this. And each and every time such an incident happens, the numbers are pretty big. It's 12 fishermen. Now, reasons for the arrest. We need to understand that India and Sri Lanka have a maritime agreement of 1974 which was signed by the then Prime Minister of India Mrs. Indira Gandhi who gave away the Kachutib Island and established boundaries in the Park Strait. But the problem arises because Indian fishermen have been fishing around the Kachutib Island for centuries and so have Sri Lankan fishermen been fishing around the region for several centuries. And hence, even when the island has been given away, Indian fishermen continue to fish around the same area. Also, the government has not created any awareness to make the fishermen aware of the boundaries, nor has it installed GPS in the motor boats which are used. When the trawlers don't have any GPS coordinates, how will the fisherman know if he is still in the Indian maritime boundary or if he has crossed over to the Sri Lankan maritime boundary? That is a problem. Large number of Indian fishermen are dependent on trawling, which is banned in Sri Lanka. Trawling, like what I said, what does it involve? It involves dropping a heavy iron net and dragging this iron net along the ocean floor. When this iron net is dragged along the ocean floor, let's say this is the ocean floor and this is the iron net. The boat, they're dropping this and they're dragging this along the ocean floor. Hence, in this process, if there are corals, corals are destroyed. If there are larvae, larvae is destroyed. Small fishes are destroyed. Recently hatched fishes are destroyed. Entire colonies of fishes are destroyed. Hence, this causes, this causes extinction. This causes coral bleaching. And this affects the entire sea ecosystem. Hence, it's a very harmful process. It's also known that the political parties 
in Tamil Nadu do not recognize the act of New Delhi, which is the Maritime Agreement of 1974. And hence, there is also a petition in the Supreme Court regarding the same. And there's also, because of this, there is also politicization of the issue. And hence, there has been, there has not been any uh, progress on the issue. Now, we can see some of the steps which have been taken by both the governments. Both the governments have established a joint working group on fisheries to look into the issue. However, despite having a joint working group, this joint working group was not active over the last two years because of certain fallouts. Hotline established between the coastal guards of both the countries in order to establish communication between the coastal guards and to ensure interoperability between the coastal guards of Sri Lanka and coastal guard of uh, India. Commitment to no violence and loss of lives of fishermen. This particular thing is mandatory because under UNCLOS UN Convention on Laws of Seas. Please read about this. Under this, you have different definitions for territorial sea. You have different definitions for contiguous zone. You have different definition for exclusive economic zone. 12 nautical miles. 24 nautical miles. 200 nautical miles. Please read about these. Till 12 uh, nautical miles, it's known as the territorial sea. And then beyond that 12 nautical miles for the next 12 nautical miles, which means total of 24 nautical miles is known as the contiguous zone. And beyond that for 200 nautical miles, it is known as the exclusive economic zone, known as the EEZ. Different functions are allowed in these three. Please read about what is allowed and what is not allowed in these three zones. Now. There has also been uh, uh, frequent releasing of fishermen on humanitarian grounds by uh, both the countries. Now, Indian government is also having a scheme known as the Park Bay Scheme, which provides for subsidized uh, motor vessels so that Indian fishermen can go for deep sea fishing. What is deep sea fishing? Deep sea fishing allows for Indian uh, motorized boats to venture deep into the ocean like the name suggests, and fish over there. When they fish over there, unlike what happens in coastal areas, there is no destruction of habitat. Also, as a way forward, what, what can we do? What can be done is that, first of all, there is a need to recognize who are the various stakeholders. We have the two unions of Sri Lanka and India, provincial governments of Jaffna and Tamil Nadu, Jaffna in Sri Lanka and Tamil Nadu in India, the navies, the coastal guards, fisheries departments and most importantly the fishing communities of both the countries. You need to get them together on the same lines and you need to form a Park Bay Authority. It is important to delegate powers to this Park Bay Authority who can then take any steps and decide how much is the sustainable catch of fishes? What is the type of fishing equipment that can be used? And what are the different days when shipping, uh, I mean, sorry, when fishing can be done by each country? This particular authority should be allowed to do. Also, we need to ban trawling in India. Okay, the next topic. The most important topic. Now, the thing that dis distinguishes India from China is its periodic elections. It is also the reason why India is called a thriving democracy. India is known as the island of democracy outside the western world. Because when you see India, 
when you see the non western world india is the only country where you have had continuous elections ever since it got its freedom democracy did not survive properly in the rest of the non western world hence india is the island of democracy in a sea of uncertainty you can use this line in your mains now context the uttarakhand goa and up phase 2 elections are these are going for elections today time of elections elections for the lok sabha and every state legislative assembly have to take place every 5 years unless called earlier after every 5 years automatically lok sabha has to go for elections and members lose their term now what is the schedule of elections how do elections happen before this we need to understand some basic terms with respect to elections i am sure you know the law which governs elections in india representation of people's act Nineteen fifty and nineteen fifty one. Now, when we see representation of People's Act, uh, you have to understand that both these acts have different different functions. Uh, <laughs> While, excuse me. while representation of people's act of 1950 deals with majorly the functions that happen before elections like preparation of muster rolls preparation of electoral rolls i mean i'm sorry drawing of the constituencies the representation of people's act of 1951 deals with most of the functions after during and after the elections now Uh, please uh, read about these two acts because they are clearly mentioned in your main syllabus also now moving on which is the body which is responsible for conduct of elections it is the election commission it is headed by the chief election commissioner do read also about what is the term of the chief election commissioner how is he removed he is removed in the same form as the judge of a supreme court what is the tenure of an ele uh, chief election commissioner can he be reappointed are the expenses of the election commission charged or voted the so please read about all of these things the expenses of the election commission are voted and the chief election commissioner can be reappointed i'm just letting you know these things but do read about the chief election commissioner and do read about election commissioners how many election commissioners are there in india and how many of them can be selected is there a law regarding the number of election commissioners and when it comes to decisions does and when it comes to decisions the election commissioner and the chief election commissioner have the same amount of power if there are two election commissioners and there is one chief election commissioner and if there is no consensus regarding the regarding the decision it goes for a vote and the decision that gets the higher number of votes prevails so the uh, election commissioner has the same amount of power as does a chief election commissioner next also uh, read about the articles which are pertaining to elections in india in the constitution they stretch from article number 
to article number 329. Now, schedule of elections. The constitution states that there can be no longer than six months between the last session of the dissolved Lok Sabha and recalling of the new house. So, elections have to be concluded before six months. So, the constitution itself states this. That there cannot be six months, more than six months before the last session of the dissolved Lok Sabha and the new Lok Sabha. The election commission normally announces the schedule of the elections in a major conference a few weeks before the formal process is set in motion. The model code of conduct for guidance of candidates and political parties comes in immediately into effect after such an announcement is made. After the election commission declares the schedule of the elections, the model code of conduct comes into play. Now, what is the model code of conduct? There is no statutory law surrounding a model code of conduct. A model code of conduct, basically, it is there to ensure that party in power does not have any special advantage as compared to the parties which are contesting the elections. This is to ensure that there is a level playing field for elections. So, major, major decisions like say for example, once after the election commission has announced the schedule of the elections, okay, the ruling party decides to make a, a scheme which announces say 15 lakhs per each family. Such schemes cannot be allowed once the model code of conduct is in place. It is not a statutory law. But it governs the conduct of parties which are conducting elections. The formal process for elections starts with the notification calling upon the electorate to elect members of a house. This notification is given out by the election commission. As soon as the notifications are issued, candidates can start filing in their nominations in the constituencies. Usually every party has a particular candidate who files in the nomination once the notification is given out by the election commission. Hence, please do look, look into the uh, schedule or look into the process uh, while mm. okay. first the election commission announces the schedule. Next. As soon as it is announced, the model code of conduct comes into play. After that, we have the notification which is announced by the election commission. As soon as the notifications are announced, we have nominations by people who want to contest the elections. These nominations are scrutinized by the returning officer. Who is the returning officer? The returning officer is the person who is in charge of that particular constituency. He is the person who declares who has won the election. Finally, and the returning officer, the role that he has to play is to uh, is that he has to ensure the smooth conduct of elections without any hampering. Also, if at all he feels that there is some subversion happening, if there is rigging of votes, or if there is if there is uh, excessive use of money power, if there is distribution of alcohol, he can cancel the outcome of the election. That is the power of a returning officer. Mm. The validly nominated candidates, see, after the nominations, after the nominations are filed, the validly nominated candidates are allowed to withdraw from the contest of elections within two days from the date of scrutiny. Once the scrutiny is done, the valid contestants, whoever is valid. Otherwise, they are rejected automatically by the returning officer. However, those who are valid, they can withdraw their nominations for two days after the scrutiny is done. And then after that, the contesting elections get at least two weeks to campaign for elections. They get two weeks to campaign for the elections. And due to the massive size of the electorate, polling is held on a number of days 
for the national elections. A separate day for counting is fixed and the results are declared for each constituency by the concerned returning officer. See, he is the person who declares it. The commission compiles a complete list of members elected and issues an appropriate notification for due constitution of the house of the Lok Sabha in case of center and the state legislative assembly in the case of states. Uh, I don't know why there is a gap over here. So please do uh, read this. Just understand the order. Uh, just a second. I guess uh, over here the topic ends. The previous topic ends. The previous topic ends. And uh, this is the next topic. This is the topic regarding the CECA of India and Australia. Like what I said, the present external affairs minister has been in Australia and hence there have been discussions regarding the India-Australia free trade agreement. Now, India and Australia have announced that they are set to conclude an interim trade agreement in March and a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement in 12 to 18 months. Now, <coughs> excuse me. What is a free trade agreement? A free trade agreement is often signed between trade partners or friends. What it does is it reduces the barriers for trade. Now these can be tariff barriers which can be customs duties, yeah, which can be anti-dumping duties etc. Or it can be non-tariff barriers which are phytosanitary measures, you know, which are documentation. It can be anything. So, a free trade agreement essentially reduces both tariff and non-tariff barriers. Okay. It is a pact between two or more nations to reduce barriers to imports and exports amongst them. Under a free trade policy, goods and services can be bought and sold across international borders with little or no government tariffs, quotas, subsidies or prohibitions to inhibit their exchange. Also, free trade agreements, to the maximum extent, they allow market access, which means that they allow the items coming from other countries to be treated on par with those products which are being produced in their own country. This is known as market access. Now, Usually, how a country reaches free trade agreement is, the, what we have is initially a preferential trade agreement. Even in the case of India, in SARC, South Asian, you know uh, what the SARC is, right? It is the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. In the case of SARC, initially we had a preferential trade agreement, which means that we had only certain items which were allowed for preferential trade, which means which can be traded with other countries of the same regional cooperation organization. From that, it usually after years and years of trade, we get a free trade agreement. A free trade agreement is a little bit more relaxed as compared to a preferential trade agreement from which we have a CECA, Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement. Further, after that, as ties develop, we move on to a customs union. The European Union is known as a customs union. Why? Because no matter where you enter in, you can enter in through Rotterdam or you can enter through Brussels. You can enter in through any of the places. However, you will have the same customs charges applicable on your products. Let it be in France or let it be in Belgium. And further, after that, you have a common market, which means that all the countries can, uh, are, I mean, the country is given the same market access as, as the products which are produced in its own territory. 
next what is this what is this early harvest this interim trade agreement this is also known as an early harvest agreement now what will this early harvest agreement cover now an interim or early harvest or trade agreement is used to liberalize tariffs on the trade of certain goods between two countries or trading blocks before a comprehensive free trade agreement is concluded so this is only a intermediate process before this what we need is this the interim agreement will cover most areas of interest for both countries including goods services rules of origin sanitary and phytosanitary measures and customs procedures i will cover all these things currently the bilateral trade between both the countries is around it's around 20 billion dollars usually however because 2021 was a washout because of covid 19 it was only 12.5 billion dollars however in the first 10 months of 2022 itself we have touched 17.7 billion dollars okay now what are when it comes to australia we have a trade deficit because we import 12.1 we have imported till now about 12.1 billion dollars of goods and services while we have exported only 5.6 billion dollars of goods and uh, services actually i would say that the bilateral trade between india and australia is around 30 billion dollars usually that is the uh, mark that we have touched uh okay now key imports from australia include coal gold and lng what is lng liquefied natural gas while key exports of the country from india include see once include diesel petrol and gems and jewelry so basically refined petroleum products once you refine crude oil after refining crude oil we get petrol diesel naphtha air turbine fuel various other polymers and resins which are used in the plastics industry etc so india actually exports out to australia products which are refined from crude oil australia has also emphasized that the agreement would lead to deeper cooperation between the two countries and critical minerals and rare earth elements now which are critical to future industries including renewable energy and electric vehicles rare earth elements like lithium also india has an agreement with australia with respect to nuclear fuel exchange which is uranium apart from this india and australia have several other uh, areas of cooperation both form a part of the quad both have several military exercises some of them are exercise malabar and then australia is also taking part in the milan naval exercises further we have os index so several exercises exist apart from all of this india and australia are also a part of the commonwealth group of nations india and australia are a form uh, are a part of indian ocean rim association iora etc and not just with australia india is actually trying to go for free trade agreements with several other countries india did not join the rcep as you might be knowing regional comprehensive economic partnership india opted out of joining the rcep because rcep was majorly a china dominated block and hence 
India is trying to go for negotiation of as many free trade agreements as possible. India is in the process of negotiating free trade agreements with UAE, UK, Canada, EU, Israel, apart from Australia itself. India is also looking to complete the intermediate agreement with UAE and UK in the first half of 2022. Not just with Australia, but with UAE and UK as well. Now, the next topic. Hacking group, modified elephant. This becomes important because we are seeing increased number of cyber security breaches. I am sure you must have heard of the Pegasus incident that rocked the, the nation sometime back. It was nothing but infiltration of devices of several prominent politicians, journalists, etc. And extraction of confidential information even without their knowledge. While Pegasus actually worked on the concept of no-click attack, which means that you don't need to click on any application. It will automatically infiltrate your device. You don't need to click on anything. However, Modified Elephant works on a different approach, which we shall see. It is not no-click. Pegasus was no-click. Okay, American cyber security firm Sentinel-1 has released a report on Modified Elephant, a hacking group that allegedly planted incriminating evidence on the personal devices of Indian journalists, human rights activists, human rights defenders, academics and lawyers. According to the report, Modified Elephant maliciously targeted specific groups and individuals including activists arrested in the Bhima Koregaon case of 2018. Now, the problem is that over here we see that modified elephant is accused of keeping information, keeping evidence, planting evidence on the devices of these people who have been arrested in these cases. Which means that for it becomes easy to target these people because of something that they have not actually done. It completely distorts. The evidence, the evidence procedure that we have under the Indian Evidence Act. Because there is planting of evidence rather than actually evidence being there. Now, how does this group work? Modified elephant operators have been infecting their targets using spear phishing emails. Now, please know what spear phishing is. Spear phishing emails with malicious file attachments. Okay. Now, spear phishing refers to the practice of sending emails to targets that look like they are coming from a trusted source. Like, say, for example, you are getting an email from the Prime Minister's office or you are getting an email from one of your close friends. So, spear phishing does that. It targets particular people with these emails. Now, this can be used to either reveal important information or install different kinds of malware on their computer systems. Now, once they install malware, it can be used to remotely operate their devices. It can be used to remotely access information from their devices. It can be used for anything. Now, modified elephant typically weaponizes malicious Microsoft Office files. What are Microsoft Office files? Files like Word documents, files like Excel sheets, Files like PowerPoint presentations. Imagine you get a Word document and within this Word document, there is a malware. Once you open that Word document, this malware gets downloaded into your system and you don't even realize it. Mm. Earlier, this particular group was using executable files like .exe. But with technology, it started moving over to Word PowerPoint, DocX files. Modified Elephant obtained remote access to and unrestricted control of their victim's devices using Netwire and Dark Comet. Now, what are these two? These are two publicly available remote access Trojans. 
In short, these are nothing but viruses which are public which are publicly available. So modified elephant was basically using these two trojans in order to remotely access information available on targeted people. In the word document, they were sending netwire and dark comet. Please remember these names. These are important. They can, these can just be asked as MCQs in your prelims. EOS launch. EOS 04 launch. ISRO's first of 2022. We know that since the last two years, ISRO has not made any, it has not made many launches. The number of launches has reduced drastically because of the Corona impact. EOS 04 will be an Earth observation satellite. Now, what are Earth observation satellites? Unlike communication satellites, which are placed either in the geostationary satellite, in the geostationary orbit or the geosynchronous orbit. The Earth observation satellites are often placed in the sun synchronous orbit. Say this is the Earth. We have the sun synchronous orbit and we have the geosynchronous and the geostationary orbits which are much farther away. Communication satellites are often placed in the geosynchronous orbit while in the sun synchronous orbit or in the polar orbit we have earth observation satellites. I mean we have observation satellites or you have uh, uh, Cartosats, you have uh, Resats, okay. All of them would be in the sun synchronous orbit or uh, the polar orbit, okay. Now, this will be the first of 19 launches planned in 2022. ISRO's busiest year till now, 2022 would be ISRO's busiest year because of 19 launches. No, till now, ISRO has never done as many launches in one year, including the Chandrayaan 3. Please uh, read about the Chandrayaan 1 and the 2. Chandrayaan 2, we had planned to send a rover to the moon. However, it was not a complete failure, but rather it was a failure in part. And then we also have the Gaganyaan mission, which is India's first space flight to space. It is unmanned. I mean, it is uh, to be done in this year itself. Uh, hence, please uh, go through uh, go through these two missions. Please do read about uh, what is the launch vehicle that will be used. I'm guessing it uh, for the Gaganyan mission. It is to be a GSLV Mark III. So please read. Now, the Earth Observation Satellite 04 is the fourth in a series of Earth Observation Satellites being launched under a new generic name, which is EOS. We have had EOS 01, 02, 03. 03 was a failure. In the earlier series of Earth Observation Satellites, CartoSat, OceanSat, ResourceSat, GSat, ScatSat and a few others have now become part of the EOS series. From now on, these shall be referred to by the newer satellites which are launched as a part of these missions like from now on if another cartosat is being uh, if another new satellite is being uh, launched to join the cartosat group of satellites it shall not be called cartosat i or cartosat j rather it shall be called eos 06 or eos 07 hence it is a new name for the existing observation satellites okay eos04 will be placed in a sun synchronous polar orbit of 529 kilometers and it is a radar imaging satellite it will replace resat1 remote imaging satellite 1 sorry uh, it is a radar imaging satellite 1 launched in 2012 radar imaging is unaffected now what is the importance of having a radar imaging satellite? 
Radar imaging is unaffected by weather, cloud, fog or the lack of sunlight and can produce high quality images in all conditions and all times. Uh, we also have two other satellites which are on the same uh, launch vehicle, InspireSat-1 and INS-2DD which will be launched along with EOS-04. Functions of the Earth Observation Satellite, you can please read it, it is very uh, straightforward. Sorry. Okay. The next topic. I am sure you have been uh, hearing about the Saint Ramanuja Acharya of late because of the Prime Minister of India had unveiled the Statue of Equality. It is a Panchaloha statue which means that it is made up of five different metals. Also along with that, the President of India unveiled a Ramanuja Chari. Uh, Charya statue on the outskirts of Hyderabad. Now, more about Saint Ramanuja Charya. He was born in Tamil Nadu and he is the most respected Acharya in the philosophy of Sri Vaishnavism. Please read about who are the other proponents of Vaishnavism. Who, uh, who and all are the renowned saints of Vaishnavism. We had Alvars and the Nayanars. Now, the Alvars were devotees of Lord Vishnu and Nayanars were devotees of Lord Shiva. So, who are the famous Alvars? Andal, Manikavas. Uh, so, please uh, go through some of the famous uh, Alvars like Nam Alvar, Andal and all these people. Um, also read uh, the famous uh, Nayanars. Uh, and uh, read the famous proponents of Sri Vaishnavism. Some of them are Nimbarka Charya, Madhava Charya. So please read about them also. Who and all are there? Just a cursorial, cursorial glance. He was also referred to as Ilya Perumal, which means the radiant one. His philosophical foundations for devotionalism were influential to the Bhakti movement. So he was one of the major proponents of the Bhakti movement along with along with uh, Shankaracharya, who was a supporter of Advaita philosophy. However, Sri Ramanujacharya was a supporter of Visishta Advaita. Some of his major works were Vedartha Sangraha, Summary of the Vedas, Sri Bhashya, a commentary on the Brahma Sutras, Bhagavad Gita Bhashya, a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. Please remember these things because Recently, there have been uh, some questions, uh, especially last year, there were questions on Mitakshara and some, some questions on uh, Dayabhaga. So, which are ancient Indian treatises. These are commentaries on other works. So, please remember these things. So, what was Vishistha Advaita? No, Vishistha Advaita is nothing but qualified monism. Just like Advaita. It is also monism. Now, there exist different forms. We have Advaita. Which talks about monism. Which says that our Atma and the Paramatma is one. It is the same. And opposite to this, we have Dvaita. Which says that our Atma and the Paramatma are different. Now, the proponent of Advaita was Adi Shankara. And the proponent of Dvaita was Madhavacharya. Now, similarly, Ramanujacharya gave Visistha Advaita, which is a different form of Advaita because he says, he gives the idea of qualified monism, which says that not every soul is a part of the supreme soul. Rather, there are certain special individuals who have attained the grace of the God. And these special individuals, only their soul is equivalent or is a part of the supreme soul. And hence it is known as qualified monism. 
or qualified non-dualism or attribute of monism. It is a school of Vedanta philosophy which believes in all diversity subsuming to an underlying unity. The underlying unity is the supreme soul and the diversity is human souls. So some people who have achieved, uh, who have achieved uh, salvation through the Bhakti Marga, only their souls are a part of the supreme soul. And hence it is known as Vishishta Advaita or Qualified Monism. Thank you.